<clears throat> so now we were talking about uh, last time we were talking about these new ideas uh, in the field and uh, we already talked about this ultra thin cell which a lot of uh, companies are pursuing alta select cell uh, a bunch of them we talked about micro concentrator this again being pursued by uh, a few people sliver based cells which were uh, you know cut this wafer into tiny tiny slivers and lay them out to essentially increase the area of your uh, material which is going to absorb the light. And then finally this, the idea which really looked a lot crazy was this pericle cell. Okay. The, so these are in, so you know these are still being actively pursued by people. Most of the people have kind of given up on this because they were not able to get the cost down, get the efficiency higher. So nowadays you know if, if you have if you want to at least demonstrate uh, or raise funding for a new kind of a cell or a new kind of design, you have to at least show more than 20% efficiency. If you can't even achieve that in a small area cell, then you know you can forget about it because efficiency has become much more important than it was five years back when thin film was more popular. <coughs> okay, so now today I want to talk about the rest of these ideas, and these are you know equally interesting or even more interesting ideas, and all of the out of these ideas, they claim to take you to this uh, very high efficiency, or efficiency which exceed the shockley coiser limit. Okay. So the pipe dream over here is again to achieve. So a good anecdote over there is you know so this band over here this represents the shockley coiser limit for different concentrations. So for one sun kind of concentration is 32 percent. For uh, thousand sun, it's around 41 percent. Right, so when Shockley Coiser and uh, Hans Coiser, specifically when they derive this limit that solar cell could be, you know, 30, 40 percent efficient, nobody used to, you know, believe them. They thought, you know, these guys are just making this up because cells were at that time only nine or ten percent efficient. But nowadays, if you at least write a research proposal on solar cell, if you don't demonstrate a path which exceeds or beats these uh, shockley coiser limit, then people think you know that you are not aiming high enough. So that is a paradigm shift, and in, in terms of what has happened uh, in the last 30, 40 years. So what we want over here is we want to achieve this very high efficiency and at the same time uh, lower cost and. Uh, we want to at least show efficiency uh, in lab of over 40% uh, for these kind of devices. Okay. So then, one of the ideas I told you was you know use a quantum well. So if you can't make a, if you can't make a multi-junction cell, so make this quantum well, which essentially this smaller band gap material absorbs uh, the lower energy photons, and these uh, larger band gap material it absorbs the higher energy photons. And we would try to keep both of these uh, both of these uh, layers pretty thin, so you know none of them essentially completely absorb the spectrum. So this gets a chance to absorb, this gets a chance to absorb, the one which is below it gets a chance to absorb. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not sitting next to it. <coughs> <laughs> so, what do you guys think? What, is this better than having just one cell? I mean, is this just better than having one band gap? If I had, you know, one cell uh, or a smaller band gap cell, is it better than those things or? So we were discussing that you know as compared to a lower band gap material, it has higher GSC. But uh, as compared to a wider band gap material, as compared to this material uh, over here, it has lower VOC as compared to this cell. So in the net, do I get any advantage of using by using this quantum well, or this is you know just one of those things which people have proposed but doesn't make any sense. Sure. So, what do you guys think? Let me ask somebody who is quite. Yeah. 
Isheng, what do you think? It's still better? Okay. So it, okay, you bring up a valid point that you know, even if you absorb and create an electron and hole pair, there's this barrier for this to get out. And last time when we were discussing this, I uh, proposed this kind of a design where you uh, essentially apply electric field. So you apply uh, electric field, uh, or you have this uh, band alignment like this, where your PNN region are more heavily doped. So this can still get out more easily if it's uh, created over here. So that kind of problem I can solve by you know, doping my p-n junction higher or creating this electric field, which helps in uh, extracting these uh, uh, carriers from the smaller band gaps there. But still, is it, I mean, what, what, what can I really do with this monomer? Is it really better than having a single band gap or? So one idea that Ben bring up that you could tune the band gap of this material, right? Depending upon uh, effective band gap. So you know, if you use a smaller, even smaller band gap for your smaller band gap material, or even higher band gap for your larger band gap material, ineffective. What is the effective band gap you can tune, right? Do you guys agree with that? Or so okay, so. What application with such a thing would be useful? Where would like tuning band gap be useful? Can we have one of the cells where we have discussed where like tuning individual band gap is of good uh, use? Wait, what do you think? No, but uh, there's one effective band gap that I'm getting, right? I'm not getting two band gap. I'm, I'm, I'm going to lose some energy when this photon falls. I mean, the electron and hole pair, which is generated at higher uh, higher band gap, falls into this. So I'm going to use. I'm going to get one effective band gap, right? But I can tune it by t effectively uh, changing the band gap of these individuals. There. So I agree that uh, that's a useful thing. But where is it a useful thing? So you remember where we talked about uh, tuning the band gap or band gap matching you did your problem set, uh, the very first problem set, you know, what kind of cell was it more useful? Multi-junction multi cell, right? So a good application of these, uh, of these uh, so this is the way you can get that electron and hole pair out, right? So Yisheng, so this answers kind of your thing. So if I have this PN junction, and I dope my PN junctions, and in between I put this layer which has these multiple quantum wells. So the carriers which are generated inside this quantum well, they can still get assisted by this field to come out of the cell instead of just staying there and recombining. Okay. So as as you guys expected, you know the place where these quantum well or these quantum dot cells are most commonly used are for these uh, multi-junction cells. And they're used to essentially tune the band gap of one of these cells where you can't like, you know, you can't tune it by lattice matching because when you're making these multi-junction cells, your hands are tight because, uh, you know, you have been asked to grow all these lattice match materials. And you can't get the optimal band gap. 
So one way you can tune the binding gap of the cell, which is not optimum, is to essentially you know, put quantum wells in it, or to put quantum dots in it, which would effectively lower or increase its binding gap. So for example, the most common cell that is used, which is uh, this uh, germanium, uh, gallium arsenide, uh, and then uh, indium gallium phosphide cell. In this cell, the, the band gap of, uh, of, uh, of my, uh, or the current is essentially limited by these top cells. The germanium has a much larger current, but since these two top cells have a much uh, lower current, the overall cell performance is limited. So if I can somehow increase the, uh, increase the current of this middle cell, it would help in increasing my overall, uh, overall cell efficiency. So the way I do that, the way I increase the current of this middle cell is that essentially I take this gallium arsenide, and then I insert these quantum dots, which are indium arsenide, which has a much, uh, which has a much smaller band gap as compared to gallium arsenide. So this is the kind, kind of stuff I do. So you see these quantum dots, these are these indium arsenide quantum dots inside this uh, gallium arsenide material. And what I'm doing is essentially effectively lowering the band gap of my gallium arsenide. And I'm doing that to essentially enable, um, enable a better performance of the cell. Okay. So it's if I if I just think of this as as an individual individual one one junction cell, then it's not really of any advantage. You know, if I can I can grow a, or you know take any other material which has a you know a, which has a band gap between one to one point four eV, and it won't give me any particular advantage as compared to that. But it's of great use, or it's of some use when I'm making this multi-junction cell, and I want to tune its uh, band gap, OK? <coughs> so now, OK, so this was, uh, this was of some advantage. But now let's, you know, let's think of a completely radical idea. And you know, this, this would be, if, if I could implement it, would uh, you know you can instantly change the whole equation of uh, solar uh, you know whatever the, you can disrupt the market you know? so let's let's you know let's let me explain it first and then we can have a discussion around it so most of the high efficiency cells that we discussed were formed by this uh, multi junction approach where you had this one material for my blue photon one material for my green photon one material for my red photon, right? And I connected all of them uh, in series. But now, what if I think of just you know one material, and it has one band gap, right? But if I could somehow engineer it so that it creates another band in between, OK? So now, you know, what I can do is I can essentially tune or engineer this uh, one band in between this uh, conduction and valence band. So now I can essentially absorb my uh, red photon between these two bands, and I can absorb my green photon between, you know, between this uh, intermediate and the conduction band. And the whole band gap of the cell, it can absorb this uh, blue photon, right? So in effect, I've created this intermediate band gap, or you know, I've engineered this extra band in between my cell. And now it's just one material, it just has one extra band in between. And now it, it, you know, you can see it's equivalent to having these three cells, right? It's it's absorbing the red light, it's absorbing the green light, it's absorbing the blue light. So it's effective to having just by introducing another band, I've made it a three-junction cell. You you guys agree? Or so has, has you know, let's try to make it uh, even more interesting. So instead of introducing uh, three bands. Uh, instead of introducing you know one intermediate band, let me introduce uh, let's say two intermediate bands. So I have essentially introduced this and this. So this was my conduction band. This is my valence band. I've introduced two intermediate bands, right? So this is equivalent to having how many band gaps? So let me count. This is equivalent to having one band gap here, two band gap here, third band gap here, fourth band gap here fifth band gap here, six band gap. Right? So this is equivalent to having a multi-junction cell with, with six band gaps. So 
So what do you guys think? This seems like a very neat idea. In fact, there's a formula here that if you introduced n band gaps, you get like n into n minus 1 by 2 uh, equal to that many number of uh, cells. So in principle, does I mean, do you think this this is this is this is like a reasonable idea? Or? Okay, so let me ask: Has anybody like heard of this, or this is like the first time we are? hearing about this. So this idea has been around for, you know, intermediate band gap cells have been talked about uh, a lot. But, uh, uh, and you know, has, has some theoretical modeling around them. So if I have a single band gap cell, I essentially, you know, get a efficiency maximum around 41% at a concentrated uh, radiation, at a radiation of uh, 1,000 suns. If I make a double junction tandem, it depends upon the band gap of, uh, you know, it depends upon the band gap of uh, those two individual cells. But I can get efficiency, you know, close to 52, 53% kind of efficiency. But if I introduce this, you know, if I introduce this intermediate band as shown over here, I can get much higher efficiency. So just by introducing this intermediate band, in theory, you can get uh, way high efficiency. So for just a three-band gap cell, a three-band cell which introduces one of these uh, intermediate bands, you can get efficiencies as high as 63% uh, over here. If you introduce uh, two intermediate bands, so you have four bands total, you can get efficiencies all the way up to 72%. Now, the catch with this is you know, outlined in this uh, footnote over here that uh, people, you know, this has been around in theory for a while. And I'll show you some, some methods which people are using to uh, make this intermediate band gap. But there's no natural semiconductor, at least I haven't heard of any natural semiconductor which has this, uh, you know, intermediate band and it has multiple of these bands. Typically when we think about band gap, the main idea is that, you know, you have this forbidden region where you don't have any bands in between, right? So it's trying to violate with the with the main uh, one of the fundamental uh, of of these uh, at least the crystalline semiconductor that you don't have bands in between your band gap, right? So what are the some of you know some people have uh, you know people who are researching on these fields? What are some of the methods uh, they have tried? So some of the methods that people have tried is that you take a crystalline semiconductor and you impart with it, impart a lot of impurities in it. So you, typical suspects are like impurities of oxygen, nitrogen, and so on. And, or, you know, when you might have heard that whenever you create these uh, impurities or you create these, uh, you create these uh, intermediate states uh, within your, uh, within your band gap. These are typically traps, but if you add a very high density of uh, these impurities, these traps will essentially start to interact with each other, and they'll form a continuous band. So that is the main idea of you know adding a lot of these uh, impurities, either by implant or by other method, to create this intermediate band. And people have done some demonstrations. You know, unfortunately, this intermediate band it's usually created. Uh, uh, many times created uh, very close to the conduction of valence band, which is of not great use. But if you could engineer an intermediate band, which is in between, you know, it would be of great use uh, for enabling this kind of effect. Then there are other people, you know, people are trying to use super lattice, quantum dots, but there's, there's not any, you know, fancy or any, uh, any result which I can take to the bank to report uh, as yet. And, uh, uh, but this paper which I've uploaded on the site, this uh, summarizes uh, all, you know, all the different approaches people have tried to create this uh, intermediate band gap. Okay?